You may know that Jesus Christ died for your sins. You may know that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead on the third day. You may know that he, 40 days later, ascended into heaven. But do you know what our Lord is doing today in heaven? Do you know what Jesus Christ is doing today on earth? Do you know what Jesus Christ is seeking to do in your life? And what difference does it make? Well, we want to answer this morning those four important questions from the Word of God as we continue our series on We Wish to See Jesus. And this morning, we wish to see Jesus and what he is doing today. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Now it is imperative that you understand that this life is not about you, first and foremost. It's about God. It's not about our plans, it's about His plan. It's not about fulfilling our objectives, but doing His will. It's not about our glory, but it's about His glory. No wonder Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. No wonder he wrote to the Corinthians and said, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of of God. No wonder the psalmist wrote in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. And dear friends, you must grasp that the purpose of God and his plan for the ages is this, to glorify his sovereignty and grace in creation and redemption, ultimately expressed in the establishment of his kingdom in the heavens and the earth through Jesus Christ. And so it's all about the glory of God, and the focus is going to be on Jesus Christ. Thus, the plan of God is Christ centered, not man centered. And yet, God is willing to bless the undeserving by his amazing grace, and he has included us in the plan. But keep in mind that God is deserving of this glory because of who he is and what he's done. In fact, join in reading with me Psalm 29, verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now you see the word due there? When something is due, it's something that's Deserving, something that's owed, that the person is worthy of. And you see, when we give God glory, it's not that he's on some eagle trip. It's that it's due his name, and his name represents who he is and what he's done. When people, when the president walks into the room, people stand. Why? Because it's due his position. When the Super Bowl champs raise the trophy and then have a parade, it's because it's do their winning. We don't know anything about that in Minnesota, but we would like to know something about this. And what is God deserving of? Glory. He's deserving of honor. He's deserving of praise. And as we think of God's plan of the ages to glorify himself, we're reminded of the seven dispensations. We're reminded how God's plan was for man to glorify God and to enjoy fellowship with him and to rule over God's dominion on this earth under God's sovereignty, but by virtue of the fact that God gave man a choice. We know that man rebelled against God, and thus we move from a state of innocence to the curse and death. And every dispensation begins with blessing. Everyone ends with judgment. 
And with every new dispensation, there's new revelation and new responsibility in which God is testing man under various conditions to see how he will respond. And thus, under conscience, God says, I want you to operate under this innate knowledge and conscience of right and wrong that you have. But we know that man, God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and he grieved the Lord that he had made man. And the result was the Genesis flood. After the flood, we know, human government was now established as never before, as God giving man delegated authority to set forth law and order with the opportunity or the responsibility, I should say, of punishment when not followed. And we know man miserably failed as man was told to go again and be fruitful and multiply the earth. Instead, they hung out in the Middle East and built the Tower of Babel and God then came down in judgment and confused the languages. And as a result, for almost two, around 2,000 years, God was dealing with the Gentiles, but now with Abraham and his call and the promises made in the Abrahamic covenant, God was beginning to deal with a, a nation, the Jewish nation in particular, who eventually got into Egyptian bondage, then were given the law at Mount Sinai, and we know that they miserably failed to keep that law. And while indeed God had promised the kingdom through the Jewish nation and to the Jewish nation. We know that when Jesus came on the scene, he offered himself king of the Jews. They rejected him, and instead, on the cross, he died for our sins and rose again to provide salvation full and free and forever to all who would simply put their faith in him. And on the day of Pentecost, we knew that the church began under the dispensation of grace, and that is what God is doing today. Christ is building his church. We know there will be the rapture of the church in God's timing. And in doing so, after the signing of the peace treaty, there will be the tribulation on earth in which the wrath of God is poured out upon the planet. And then Jesus Christ returns in all his second coming glory to set up the first stage of his eternal kingdom called the millennium which at the end of, there is another rebellion, as it were, and there is then the great white throne judgment for the lost, and eternity future is entered into. And if you understand the gospel clearly, if you understand the three tenses of salvation, and if you understand the dispensational plan of God, you know more than 90% of the pastors in our world, unfortunately. But don't you get puffed up, because unto whom much is given, much is required. And our desire is not merely informational, it's transformational. But these truths are very, very important. You see, dear friends, do you understand that human history is his story, and that every dispensation reveals that man, under all conditions, is a flop and a failure spiritually in self-rule and self-dependence apart from the grace of God through Jesus Christ? In fact, Ephesians 2, 7 reminds us that in the ages to come, God is going to show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And you and me are going to be trophies of grace. Saved by grace, kept by grace, used by grace. And in addition to this, God's plan of the ages reveals that God is God and there's no one else like him. And thus sovereign over Satan, creation, the angels, man, the Gentiles, and Israel, all to the glory of God. So as we think of God's plan, as we think of this present dispensation of grace, as we think of the church age in which we live, what exactly is Jesus Christ doing today in heaven? What's he doing on earth, and what's he doing in your life? Well, the first thing we want to emphasize is, what's he doing in heaven? And this may not be an exhaustive list, but it clearly is found on the pages of Scripture. The first thing we want to note is that he is being exalted. 
at the right hand of the Father after his humiliation and finished work. He is being exalted. Now, when we pick up Acts chapter 2, Christ has died for our sins. He's been raised from the dead. In Acts chapter 1, he ascends into heaven. He tells them to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, baptized believers into the body of Christ, and even gave evidence of his presence through speaking in tongues. Now, tongues were the ability to speak in a known foreign language apart from the learning process. Thus, they began to speak the wonderful works of God in languages they had never learned. And this caught the attention of the crowd that was gathered at Pentecost. And in doing so, Peter then gets up and preaches in basic Aramaic the truth of the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for our purposes, we want to pick it up in Acts chapter 2. Verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, David was a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, his descendants, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ, the Messiah to sit on his throne, on David's throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God. Now let me pause. Notice, he's not exalted to the throne of David. The throne of David, dear friends, is an earthly throne located in Jerusalem. That is not where Jesus Christ is today. But he is raised up and he has ascended and he is at the right hand of God. Being exalted to the right hand of God, verse 33. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, the Holy Spirit, which you now see and which you hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Verse 36. <laughs> Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, the right hand of God is the place of honor. It's the place of glory. In fact, even in the future, in the sheep and goat judgments, which happens at the end of the tribulation, at the beginning of the kingdom, those on the right are blessed and they go into the kingdom. Those on the left of Jesus are cursed and they're put into everlasting fire. Notice again, the right versus the left. And Jesus Christ, during his earthly ministry, walked in humiliation. He became a man. He was subject to all the events of humanity, yet without sin. He was there with veiled glory, only displaying a little, like on the Mount of Transfiguration. But today, dear friends, he is in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father, and he has a heavenly ministry in which he is experiencing exaltation with great splendor and glory in fulfillment of his prayer in John 17 as well. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. For the writer of Hebrews seeking to encourage these believers who were under persecution and in threat of going back to the defunct Judaism they were saved out of, instead of going on following Jesus Christ by faith, have presented to them in the book of Hebrews how Christ is superior, how he is better than anything the law or the Old Testament sacrifices could offer. And for our purposes, we pick it up in verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us how? By his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Why? Because he's creator. 
through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, because he was God in human form, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, what did he do? He sat down, where? At the right hand of the majesty and high. Now, I really like this verse in light of my Roman Catholic background, because I can still remember as a kid going up to the place where they would have candles on the side. And you could put in your money and light a candle and pray a prayer for someone in purgatory. There is no purgatory in the Bible. It's either heaven or hell. And furthermore, purgatory was supposedly a place where people would be purified from their sins. And yet, what do we read here? When he had by himself purged our sins. He purged our sins on the cross and making full payment for them. And as a result, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty and I. And why is he seated on the right hand of the Father? Because it is finished. And that's why as we make our way now to Hebrews chapter 10, we see that is the very argument of the writer of Hebrews. And how the Old Testament sacrifices could never take away sins. We pick it up in verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not twice or thrice. And every priest in the Old Testament stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Otherwise they wouldn't but have ceased to be offered. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down where? At the right hand of God, the place of exaltation. From that time, waiting till his enemies were, are made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now, I did not understand with my upbringing what was pictured and what was going on up front well, even though I was an altar boy and a scripture reader and so forth. But you see, one thing I did know when I saw this verse is that the priest's work was never done. Another mass, another bloodless sacrifice of the mass, day after day after day after day after day. Why? Because it was never finished. And though I had heard that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, I never understood that on the cross, he did it for me, and on the cross, he did it so completely, there was not another mass that was needed. There was no purgatory that was needed. There were no works of atonement that were needed. That it wasn't a matter of getting my good to outweigh my bad. Christ said it's finished, it was paid in full, there was nothing left to do. And that's why he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And when you understand that truth, and you understand there's nothing left for you to do but receive this as a gift by faith in Christ alone, at that moment of faith in Christ, you're saved. And you become a new creation in Christ. So what is Jesus doing today? He's at the right hand of the Father and he's being exalted for who he is and what he's done. And you know what I say to that? Thank you, Jesus, for paying the full penalty of our sins and that you now are seated at the Father's right hand in your rightful place of exaltation. But that's not all. For the second thing that Jesus is doing today is he is preparing a place for church-age believers before he comes again for them. He's preparing a place for church-age believers before he comes again for them. Now, you don't need to turn to John 14. You're probably pretty familiar with it. But here in the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus has just announced that he was going to leave them. He has just announced that one was going to betray him. He just announced that one was going to deny him. And they were, like Elvis said, all shook up. I think it was Elvis. They were shook. Wouldn't you be? And you know what he tells them? Let not your heart be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. This is an appeal to believers who had already trusted in Christ as their Savior to now trust him in these circumstances of life. You see, it only takes one act of faith to be saved. It takes an ongoing attitude of faith day after day to enjoy the faith rest life. For Christ came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Are you enjoying the abundant life? Are you learning to faith rest in him, even in the stresses and trials of life? And every day is a new day to learn to rely on the Lord. But then what did he say? He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to do what? To prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you also, you may be also. Now keep in mind that in the first century, in the bridal wedding events, what would happen normally is that about a year before the wedding, there was a betrothal. And what would happen is that someone would come and they would propose and they would talk to the parents. And a lot of times there was matchmaking going on, like the fiddler on the roof. And in doing so, some price was set for the, the bride's dowry. You know, I've jokingly said it would be a tremendous price or a couple lame chickens, depending on what they valued. I heard there was an engagement this weekend. I wonder what the price was. <laughs> and as a result, there would be this agreement made, this binding agreement that somewhere in the future there would be a marriage. And you know, what did the guy do in the meantime? He would go back to his father's house and he would build on. He would prepare a place for his bride. And then the bride was to be ready so that at any time, should the groom come with his entourage, she would be ready, and as a result, her bridesmaids would be gathered, and they would make their way then to the father's house where the ceremony would transpire and the marriage would be consummated, and then they would live there. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. That he went to heaven to go to prepare a place for his bride. And if you're a believer today, you're part of the bride of and one day he's coming again, he's going to receive you to himself, that where he is, you may be also. And by the way, the home is not in Arizona. Or Texas. Or whatever may be appealing to you. It's in heaven. That's where he went. And he's preparing a place for you. Incredible. But keep in mind, when it comes to the return of our Lord, he comes in two phases. First, he comes, as it were, for his saints here at the rapture, and then with his saints when he will come to the earth. The first is in the air, the second is to the earth, and there's a time gap between the two, though it's all part of his coming. And you know, when I hear that, you know what I think of? Thank you, Jesus that you've gone to heaven to prepare a place for me and for others that have been saved, and that you're coming again to receive us to yourself, that where you are, we're going to be also. Now you might say, well, that sounds really wonderful, but what if a believer dies before Jesus Christ comes again? Well, that's the third thing he's doing in heaven. He is welcoming home his born-again children upon death. He is welcoming home his born-again children upon death. And you're probably very familiar with the verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, yes, well, please, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You see, the moment you absent this body, you're present with the Lord. Now, that is only a promise for a believer, not an unbeliever. There's no such thing as soul sleep. Souls do not sleep. It's bodies that sleep awaiting the resurrection. And that is why Paul would say in Philippians 1.23, For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart. And what does that mean? 
to be with Christ, which is far better. Far better than opening weekend of fishing. Now, that doesn't mean physical death still isn't ugly in ways it is. But that person, by virtue of their faith in Christ and receiving eternal life at a point in time upon physical death, that eternal life now translates right into heaven as their body awaits the resurrection and they are far better, far better. You see, in Acts chapter 7, there was the situation in which Stephen was preaching to the Jewish crowd, and they were intensely negative towards the gospel. And he was not some pansy of a preacher. And we read in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and now notice this, Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city. And they stoned him. That's how much they rejected his message. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who would become saved in Acts 9 and the Apostle Paul. They stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And that's what happens when you die. Then he knelt down and he cried with a loud voice this incredible phrase. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Sounds a lot like his own Savior said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when he said this, he fell asleep. What fell asleep? His body fell asleep as his soul and spirit then entered the presence of God. And notice, it was Jesus who was standing there waiting for him. And that's why I've shown this picture over time. Now, I was talking to Jackie Lynch the other day. Did you know Jim just died? And uh, she said, you know, his faith has become sight. It's true. She says, and I hope that picture of yours is right. <laughs> Well, I don't know if it's exactly like this, but it's clearly something like this, isn't it? Can you imagine going home to be with the Lord? Welcome home, my child. Welcome home. Fill in the blank. For you see, while indeed we look forward to the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ, and indeed while he can come at any time, he has not yet come. And that's why what was said in Psalm 90, verse 10, is still true. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they're 80, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. Not true. After 70, so much labor. Get up in the morning. Oh, 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 Betsy, you know, and it's sorrow, pain. You're, have you ever noticed the number one visit you make is to the doctor? For it is soon cut off and we fly away. And that's where that song comes from. Sloth fly away. As I've said before, the average death of a male presently is 77. That means if you're 39 years old, you're already going downhill, man. The average death of a female is 83. If you're 42, you're already over the hill. Boy, that's sobering, isn't it? So you're ruining my Mother's Day, Pastor. <laughs> but I would like to challenge you, what are you investing in? Because your life is soon passing away. 
It's a vapor. And you know, as I think of going to prepare a place for you, you know, a home is really only a home when there's, there's people you love there. I remember when Nancy and Sarah were in Michigan, oh, five or six years ago for some schooling for Sarah. And we went, you know, eight months or whatever it was without, you know, I had to commute back and forth. You know, I'd come home at night and I'd look at that house and I'd say, this is just a house without my family here. Because it's a family that so often that really makes a house a, a home. And you know what I say to all this? Thank you, Jesus, for welcoming home every born-again child of God when upon death they enter your presence. That's what he's doing in heaven today. But that's not all. Number four, he is interceding before the Father on our behalf. He's interceding before the Father on our behalf. And while you should be still turned to the book of Hebrews, turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Now in... In the middle chapters of Hebrews, the writer is seeking to explain how the priesthood of Christ is better than the Old Testament priesthood or the defunct priesthood. Because one of the raps against Christianity among the Jewish committee is you don't have a high priest, you don't have a sacrifice, you don't have a temple. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, yes, we do. We have a temple in heaven. Secondly, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Number two, yes, we have a sacrifice. It was the last sacrifice on the cross. And yes, we have a priest. We have a high priest. In fact, we have a great high priest. And so in Hebrews chapter 7, we pick it up in verse 23. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. They kept dying off. But he, Jesus Christ, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. In other words, you need no replacement. You need no substitute. Why? Because he doesn't die off and need a replacement. Therefore, here's the conclusion, verse 27. He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Notice, he is able to say he has the inherent power to accomplish what he wills to do, and in this case, to save in all its aspects, including glorification. And he does it to the uttermost, completely. He fulfills that objective, but not to everyone. Only to those who come to God through him. Not through a church or a ritual or a commitment, but only through Jesus Christ. And this is true since he always lives to make intercession for them. Well, I'm so thankful for that. That not only did Christ die for all so that all could be saved, but he also <coughs> now ever lives to make intercession for us in which he guarantees our eternal security. And in a sense, he's always there for us. Now, if you go with me to 1 John chapter 2, which isn't far away, we read about the fact that he's not only interceding for us, but he's also acting like a defense attorney. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word advocate speaks of a defense attorney. But what's interesting about this defense attorney is he's righteous. That isn't always true down here. Sometimes lawyer and righteous don't go together. But not with our defense attorney. And he himself, verse 2, is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but also for the whole world. 
And thus we see that the Lord Jesus Christ is the defense attorney for believers, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Ours is a reference to who? Oops. Let's get this back here. Want to bring, come here, Brandon, and bring it up? I don't know what happened. So it says, our sins is in reference to little children in the verse. And not ours only, but the sins of the whole world, which means that Christ's death made provision for everyone to be saved. It's farther back than that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And so again, a propitiation. You know, I will say this. Some of the modern translations don't translate propitiation, propitiation. <clears throat> and it, it takes away. Sometimes they use expiation. And it really doesn't do justice to the word. The word means, dear friends, that God has been satisfied with the payment of Christ in our behalf. He's a propitiation for our sins, believers, not ours only, but also for the whole world, the whole world of sinners. Everybody gets included in the death of Christ. You say, now, if this is true, why would a believer need a defense attorney? Well, I think we have an indication of that in Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, where we see at the midpoint of the tribulation, the great dragon, Satan, was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. He's the accuser of our brethren. It's interesting, isn't it? Seems to set forth like a courtroom scene in which Satan comes along and says, well, you know Dennis Roxer. You know some of the sins he's done. And you know what Christ says? But I was a propitiation for those sins. And God the Father slaps his gavel and says, he's been justified. No one and nothing will ever separate me from his love. Case dismissed. Hallelujah. As we think of that, go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, in this great chapter of the Bible, let's pick it up for our purposes in Romans 8 and verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, and he is, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Here's that idea. The accuser of the brother. Someone bringing a charge. The answer is, it is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us again. You see, if God has declared us righteous, and he has, not on the basis of what we've done, but on the basis of who Christ is and what he's done, and how through simple faith in him, we've trusted in him to save us, God has imputed Christ's righteousness to us, and as a result, God can declare us justified in the court of heaven. And if God is the one who justifies, who can point their bony finger at us and say, guilty or not worthy? Because indeed, we were guilty, but our sins have been washed away, and God's, Christ's righteousness has been put to our account. And though, again, we were guilty, we have a standing before God now. That is righteous. 
And notice his argument isn't, yeah, but he has a lot of fruit in his life. It's not, but he's really been a persevering believer. Oh, no, 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 no. It's all about, it's Christ who died. It's Christ who's been risen. It's Christ who's at the, there it is again, friends, right hand of God. It's Christ who makes intercession for us. You see, our salvation and security does not depend upon us, but upon the fact that Christ died, was risen, he's at the right hand, and he makes intercession for us. And when I say that, I say, thank you, Jesus, for not only being our crucified and risen Savior, but thank you that you have us in mind at the Father's right hand even now, as you ever live to make intercession. Now, as I think of that, go to Hebrews chapter 4. We see the fifth thing that Jesus Christ is doing today in heaven. He is providing access to the throne of grace for us. In Hebrews chapter 4, the continuation of the thought of this great high priest, we pick it up in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Now, by the way, in the Old Testament, no priest was ever called great. High priest, yes, not great high priest. Who has passed, now watch this, through the heavens. You see, when he ascended, he went through the first heaven, which is as we look at the air and the birds and where they planes fly, through the second heavens, we call that space, and he goes right to the third heaven, to the very throne room of God. Verse 14, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, because he became a man, and yet, the only difference was he was without sin. Now, here's the conclusion. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, let us. This is available for every believer. Let us. Therefore, in light of the fact that we have this great high priest, who is exalted and the right hand of the Father, let us come boldly, confidently. You see, a priest in the Old Testament was involved primarily in two things, prayers and sacrifices. And therefore, Jesus Christ provides for us access even in prayer now, that we can come boldly to the throne of, I love this, grace. Not the throne of judgment, but the throne of grace. For what objective that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, in our times of need, God is teaching us to turn to him. God is seeking right now in your needs, in your trials, in your decisions, in your difficulty, regarding your future or whatever, Will you come boldly to the throne of grace? Will you bring this to the Lord? Will you talk to him about it? Will you cast your care upon him, for he cares for you? Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will not suffer the righteous to be moved. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understand shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Are you carrying that burden today, or are you cast it in on the Lord? See, one of the problems we have is we cast the burden on the Lord and then we take it back. Stick it back on. And then we walk. How you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing really good under the circumstances. What are you doing under the circumstances? You should be living in light of who you are in Christ. And yes, we have real feelings. And by the way, let's get something clear here. Some people think, you know, if you have real feelings, you must be not looking to the Lord. No. You know, if you're grieving, you must not be looking. No, we grieve, but not as those that have no hope. Our feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. Our warrant is the word of God. Nothing else is worth believing. 
And so again, there's nothing wrong with feelings. Just remember, they make a great caboose and a terrible engine. And when you allow the Word of God to direct your thinking, so regardless of how you're feeling, you're turning to the Lord, you're going to the throne of grace, your faith resting in His promises, you're saying, now my will be done, your will be done, I'm yielding to you in order to accomplish your objectives as you work in me and through me, you will have rest of soul. But I'll tell you, when you're fighting the Lord's will, or you're relying on yourself, you'll find yourself in Romans 7, the things you want to do, you don't do, the things you don't want to do, you do, and therefore you will be frustrated in life, and when you're out of fellowship, you will be miserable. Pastor Racky used to say, find the ten worst drunks in town, and five of them are believers bucking the Lord. <laughs> I don't know the odds, but you get the point. The point is, when you're bucking the Lord as a believer, you do not have inner joy or peace. You're fighting it, because you're trying to get your will done. God bless my plans, but it's got to work out this way. God says, uh, I'm on the throne, you're not. My plan's better than yours. Or we try to do God's will, but we try to do it our way or through our strength, and that's frustrating too. We either miserably fail or we succeed more miserably. Because you know what? You may actually crank it out and get through it. And then you walk around like you did it. And the fact of the matter is you might have. And you just got your reward because you're not getting it before the Lord. And you, you're teaching yourself to rely on yourself, which comes naturally as it is. On the other hand, when you're walking by faith in the sufficiency of the Lord, you're relying on his promise, you're communing with him as you're walking through this, you can be what God wants you to be and therefore do what God wants you to do regardless if all hell is breaking out around you and everything is collapsing, but you're looking to Christ, you're relying on him, and he's giving you stability and strength and perspective in the midst of this, for apart from a right vertical relationship with God, man is miserable and life is meaningless and you can either learn it from Ecclesiastes or you can learn it through the school of heart knocks. God's plan is better. And this is what he's trying to do. And so we have seen, as Jesus said here, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you do anything in my name, I will do it. So those are five things Christ is doing today in heaven. Now let me just give you one on earth because we're never going to get through it anyhow. Okay? <laughs> what is our Lord Jesus Christ doing today on earth? Just one thing we want to end with here today. Namely, he is saving sinners by his amazing grace. He is saving sinners by his amazing grace. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now this should not surprise us, for Jesus Christ himself said in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, or that which is lost. By the way, there's going to be a memorial service this Thursday. And in doing so, there's going to be a lot of people here, I believe, who are, you would not category, categorize as religious. You're going to be a rough crowd sometime. I am so excited to give the gospel. <laughs> Those are the kind that see their need quicker. And I'm going to talk about down with religion, up with Jesus Christ, and let's see what he did. Because, you know, regardless of how we lived after we were saved, and indeed that's very important, the bottom line is that we've been saved. And I don't know how many of them have ever heard a clear gospel presentation. I'm sure many of them are turned off to church. And I am too, when it's religion. You see, Christ is saving sinners by his amazing grace. And that's why we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank who? Christ Jesus our Lord. That's who I thank. 
Why? Because he's enabled me. Because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now let me just comment. You know, I hear a lot about God's love today, but I'll tell you, sometimes I think it's really perverted. It's kind of like God loves me. Versus God loves me? Big difference where you put the emphasis. And Paul is putting the emphasis on the latter. I thank Christ Jesus, the Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, something you can believe. It's worthy of all acceptance. If you haven't accepted it yet, you can accept it now. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm the foremost. In other words, if God can save Paul, he can save anybody. By the way, on the one hand, he was the chief of sinners. On the other hand, he probably had more religion per square foot than anyone who walked on the planet at that time. But you see, religion doesn't save you. All our righteousness are like filthy rags. And therefore, I'm sure as he was persecuting Christians and dragging them off to jail, they were giving him the gospel as he went. They were probably saying, Lord, forgive him for he does not know what he's doing. They were probably praying for him. They were probably telling him the Lord loves him in spite of his sin and Christ died for his sins and rose again. And on the Damascus road, he met the risen Christ. And Jesus spoke to him. And he came to put his faith in Jesus Christ. He was saved by the grace of God. You see, there will be no one in heaven peacocking around saying, well, you know why I'm here. <laughs> I was a deacon in my church. I was a good person. You know, I did a lot of good works. Man, I was... I was something. Oh no. Oh no. Verse 16, however, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. In other words, if I got in on it, so can they. If God was patient with me, he's patient with them. If I believed in Christ and I got everlasting life, so can they, is the idea. Because you see, one thing that Christ is doing today, he's saving sinners by his amazing grace, because that's why he came. And you know what I say to all that? Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your wonderful word. It has been thought-provoking to think about what our Lord Jesus is presently doing in heaven as well as on earth. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died for our sins, and not ours only, but the sins of the whole world, because you were not willing that any should perish. We know that our Father wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, and therefore he sent you into the world to die, the punishment we justly deserved, and full payment for our sins, and then to raise you again, so that you can save to the uttermost, those who come to God through you. And should anyone be here today who has never yet been saved, may they understand today the simple message of the gospel and put their faith in the finished work of Christ so that they can know beyond the shadow of a doubt they're saved because it doesn't depend upon them, it depends upon what Christ did for them and that you cannot lie, your word is always true. 
And for those of us who have been saved, we're looking forward to the day of we're going to go home. We know that absent from the body will mean face to face with the Lord Jesus. We know that you're welcoming home sinners. You're ever living to make intercession for them. But we also know you're saving sinners. And you even want to use us as an instrument in your hands to give the gospel to others. And may we be willing to do just that. Motivated by the love of Christ. Recognizing we're ambassadors for him. Seeing a lost world as you see them. And giving them the good news as opportunity affords. May we live a life that honors you out of gratitude for your grace. That would be a believable platform by which we may proclaim the message of life to those who are spiritually dead. And that he that has the Son then would have life. And be assured of that. Father, thank you also that you have a wonderful plan for our lives after we're saved. And yet there are many challenges, many trials, many difficulties. Thank you so much that due to the Lord Jesus, we can even pray. We can even cast our cares upon you. And for believers that are struggling right now with something in their life, I just pray they would cast those cares on you. If they've been bucking you, they've been fighting your will, may they be quick to just confess their sin. For you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we're anxious about the future, may we remember that we're not to be anxious about anything and sufficient is the trouble thereof today. And that we can trust you that you have plans for us. You have a future and a hope for us. And we thank you for that. And so, Father, we just give you the glory. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And we appreciate so much the opportunity to learn more about our Savior today. We have seen Jesus in his heavenly glory. And we look forward to learning more next time. And what he's doing on earth and what he seeks to do in our life. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.